What is up, generals? We are back with the Panda Kraut, or sorry, uh, JNP Rebalance mod, uh, <clears throat> Confederate Major General. Let's play. We are preparing, uh, fighting our way through the campaign leading up to Gaines Mill and Malvern Hill, and we are preparing the army for the skirmish at Cross Keys. We're getting everything prepared. Um, and uh, at this moment, I'm showing a little bit of the camp screen. I'll do a dedicated camp video later to show um, kind of the state of the army and the thought process going into developing it. At the moment, my predominant focus is still um, establishing uh, a solid core of both veterans and high-level officers. Uh, I'm finding it relatively easy to farm colonels, but I'm having a difficulty getting officers above the rank of colonel. And I have a suspicion that casualties above the rank of colonel are going to be um, particularly painful. So Cross Keys states that we can bring 12 units. Uh, I bring a 13th just in case um, on the off chance. But it occurs to me now it's not one of those battles that has uh, um, reinforcements. So this might have been a, a silly precaution. Uh, so we bring um, eight infantry units of 1,250 men with various grades of rifles, all perked for accuracy. We bring three artillery, two smoothbores, one um, of 24-pound howitzers, one six-pounders uh, intended for close-in work, and one larger counter-battery unit. And then the last unit that we bring along for the fight is a um, is the sniper unit and their, their work. Um, all, you can almost say that they're an additional counter-battery unit. Uh, in a lot of ways, I think that they fill that role as well. They have uh, excellent reach and um, the ability to really kind of shut down artillery by putting a lot of morale damage on them fairly quickly. So uh, in cross keys, uh, in the vanilla game and of course also in the rebalance, your command is tasked with holding these two flags on either side of the river. Now, in the past, when I've played this uh, at the, the Brigadier General um, level, I've uh, quickly rushed my men across the river and taken up covered positions. See how the, the forest here makes a big U-shape? Um, at the right edge of that U-shape, essentially occupying the last covered terrain and then forcing the Union to fight out in the open. So there's two problems with this. One, at Major General, um, that's a strategy that's almost certainly guaranteed to result in a large number of casualties, especially if they get to make it to melee. And two, um, with the speed at which everything moves in this uh, rebalance, I'm not confident that I can get there in time before Union troops spawn. So instead, I've opted for a slightly more... Um, defensive uh, deployment intended to catch, use the terrain to my advantage. The two flags that I have to defend are both on this side, my side, whatever, of a creek or a river. And in both instances, to get to the flag, the Union has to enter the creek or river. So while musketry is not what it is in the vanilla game, it's still very powerful and um, can do some pretty serious work. So the objective is to deploy first and second rifles up to the far north um, as sort of a spoiling unit to counter um, any attempts to flank my position. Uh, and then we have the sharpshooters who are ultimately going to wait for the Union to commit to their attack um, on the northern flag. <clears throat> and then they're going to loop around as far to the flank as they can get and uh, start pinging at whatever targets present themselves. Um, be that uh, artillery or officers or supply wagons or all of the above. Um, briefly, I debate deploying all of my troops right along um, the position basically they're at right now. Ultimately, however, I decide to put um, fifth and sixth infantry in in the woods near the flag um, <clears throat> in a position where the edge of their musket um, range is in the water uh, or just on this side of the water. And uh, predominantly I do that because I don't want them getting into a firefight 
with the union on the other side of the river. Um, be, because shooting at units and cover is obviously ineffective and everything else. So, so I, I, I want the earliest opportunity that my men have to fire on the union is when they're in the open on my side of the Creek or when they're in the Creek, depending on how things shake out. Um, additionally, I push up uh, first and fifth artillery um, to support fifth and sixth rifles. Then on the south, uh, we have, um, oh, what is it, eight, seven, and four, I think, is the eighth, seventh, and fourth infantries uh, are all deployed on the, um, in a blocking position to the south. They have a much wider river with narrow crossings to defend. However, um, I think if I had to play this battle over again, I would have brought an additional. I would have sent um, third ordinance down to support them as well. So uh, ultimately what happens is infantry without support uh, are able to fight off um, Union attacks for a while, but eventually they are just outnumbered by um, large numbers of Union infantry marching in essentially a column. So our defensive fires uh, degrade and ultimately rout um, the leading and second edge uh, of their artillery, but they are able to, um, or not artillery, infantry, but they're able to, to, to advance into contact with the unit behind it. And they have skirmishers to probably screen and everything else. So artillery would have made a big difference um, here. But as you can see, fourth and eighth rifles are positioned in, in a way that they'll be firing on units in the water as soon as they show up. Um, operative word, when they show up. Uh, at the moment, I'm just being sort of probed with Union skirmishers who are rather quickly shot down. Um, and then we have our first uh, proper infantry engagement, which is promptly shelled into oblivion. Um, <clears throat> and then that's that's my cue to, to start thinking about advancing with uh, the light foot. Um, the sharpshooters. Uh, I start getting an indication of like where the Union flank is, and essentially they're just making a beeline for the flag. Obviously, um, <clears throat> so I, I make sure that Third Ordinance is firing at cannons as it's supposed to be doing, and additionally, it's uh, firing at the edge of the very out outward edge of its accuracy curve. So the ten pound Parrot. Um, I don't have the opportunity to look it up right now, but the ten pound Parrot. When you look at its stats. Its damage curve um, weirdly curves back upward or dips back upward as you uh, start to get out towards the outward edge of its shell, um, a solid bolt uh, damage curve. So smoothbore weapons are more and more damaging the closer you get. Okay. Um, and the 10-pounder, uh, or a 10-pound parrot, um, follows a, a lot of the same rules with regard to that particular portion of the damage curve. But um, as you go out, most artillery drops off into very low numbers, and the 10-pound parrot actually ticks back upward, um, which is interesting. So it, it starts off hitting in the in the mid, mid-40s, mid I want to say, up close, uh, and then drops down to the typical you know 8% or whatever at the long ranges. And then it's it extreme, extreme long range. It ticks back up to 15%, so it actually hits pretty hard relative to other artillery at its extreme range. And I would imagine the 20 pound parrot does the same more or less and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, ultimately they, the union attempts a couple of times to attack the center and uh, the artillery is the real bully uh, of this portion of the map. Um, the infantry do a good job too. You know, we, we, we certainly cause a lot of, uh, damage to their uh, skirmishers um, but the real killer up close like this is for sure the artillery and, and of particular note first artillery who at Shiloh I had uh, had first artillery utilizing um, howitzers I think 12 pound howitzers and I think it's possible that I'd had uh, first artillery present at the battle of first Winchester and they were using howitzers then as well I've changed them back uh, down to the six pounders and they're just really really outperforming 
uh, the 12 pound howitzer here at the six pound uh, with the six pound gun. Now again, <clears throat> that uh, damage curve has been flagged as um, a point that needs to be rebalanced by the team of the rebalance mod. So, so likely the six pounder will receive a bit of a, a kick in the teeth. Um, but for the time being, it is a beast um, on the battlefield. However, it's uh, damage drops off very quickly. So it's only really useful um, in the first half of its range arc. And outside of that, it, it, it certainly you can shoot at things and it will do work, but it's not nearly as effective. Um, <clears throat> you're seeing a little bit of what I was talking about um, on the north um, half of the battlefield. The Union continues to press and then be repulsed by artillery but in the south um despite being in the open despite crossing a river despite lead brigades uh routing and falling back ultimately they are able to um just kind of soak up the fire and keep coming and so this is a very frustrating situation for eighth infantry uh gordon charges me and i just keep pressing fall back keep pressing fall back and i'm able to outrun him barely um and I'm I'm shocked at how long he's able to keep up the charge. Like I'm 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 waiting for him to get tired. Is essentially what's happening. As my my goal is for Gordon to get tired from the act of charging halfway across the map, and then eventually I'll um, pour fire into him. But it just doesn't seem to have any effect on him. Now, um, if the counter argument is just let them charge and see how that works, uh, take a look at how. Uh, who is that? Seventh Infantry, I think, is doing. So Seventh Infantry is locked into combat with one unit and is being support given support fire by two other units. So Fourth Rifles is currently firing support fire into Seventh Melee, as is uh, Third Rifles. And the Union has just charged a second brigade into Seventh's position. Um, this My army is currently not optimized for Melee. Uh, and it shows. Um, I still think that fires is the better uh, overall tactic, but in this particular instance, it starts to really show the power of mass melees, and also, of course, the fact that the Union units are larger than mine by about 500-ish men. The Confederates came into this battle with an average, or actually um, a uniform unit size of 1,250, um, and that is probably the size I'm going to be using going forward um, for uh, at least the foreseeable future um, insofar as I know that the Union will scale up to me. So uh, I, am, I am debating hanging out with my units because I know the Union scales upward. I'm debating hanging out with my units somewhere in the vicinity of like We'll have to play with scaling and see where they grow to, but 1,500, give or take. And the thought process is that in the JNP rebalance mod, the original damage degradation curves still exist, uh, or rather the efficiency degradation curves still exist. So um, briefly, Gordon has finally tired himself out from charging. I attempt to maneuver eighth up to the hill so I'm not firing uphill or in a downhill defile. I've begun to maneuver uh, my first and second brigade into um, the the offensive counterattack, which is going to be a uh, progressive right flank with... Um, Fifth light foot hunting the artillery to make sure that they are degunned, and then first, second brigade, and then whatever forces I'm able to ultimately split off, supporting a flank attack around the Union right flank. In the meantime, however, I am just trying to stabilize my south. So um, back to unit sizes. So the original damage degradation curves exist efficiency degradation curves exist and what that means is a union brigade larger than about 1650 uh will perform worse than a unit smaller than it i don't know where the ideal math point is but i assume 
that something in the vicinity of 2,000 uh, plus or minus um, a few hundred is where like they would perform the least, they would perform the worst. And so the, the hope, the thought process is that if my units are that large, they're going to be under the cap and performing at the, as the best they can. And the union units are going to be um, triggering the cap and performing poorly. And so when the units are fresh and large and uh, new, we can batter the hell out of them and sort of establish the flow of the battle or establish the um, the front line of the battle and the tempo and everything and uh, degradate them or degrade the units by you know killing officers ideally and 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 wounding units and everything else and uh, that by the time that I transition into the offensive the union uh, by the by the time the units stabilized or the units are performing sorry I have lost my train of thought by the time the units the union units have been knocked down to the point that they are performing normally so to speak they will have suffered four or five six hundred casualties and will be suffering new debuffs associated with those casualties. So that's the hope. That's the overall plan. Now let's work on how the hell I make that happen. Um, because, yeah, you you have the possibility of scaling your brigades to like 6,000 men or whatever, just getting huge, huge units. And I think that units that large... Uh, they're, they're, they have the potential to be fun, but these maps are not scaled such that units of that size will perform well on them. Um, I'm having a hard time figuring out how I want to say what I want to say. So like, I don't think 3,000 man brigades are going to perform well on these maps because they're scaled for you know, 2,000 man brigades being the norm. They're additionally, if you've got one 3,000 man brigade, you know, two, three, four enemy units can shoot at it or the size. Now, admittedly, they'll, they're, if, if I have 3,000 man brigades, they'll have, you know, 3,700 man brigades or something. But the, I think the point still stands is, is that you suffer that experience or uh, efficiency penalty, and I'm not sure it's worth it. But I would like to utilize scaling to trick the enemy into triggering those uh, performance differentials so that their units, while large, will perform relatively poorly on a man-for-man basis. And by the time they have suffered enough casualties such that they no longer trigger those penalties, um, hidden though they may be, my units will have inflicted, I don't know, 600 casualties, and those units will be suffering from other debuffs associated with those casualties that don't have anything to do with the unit's starting size, or rather, um, current size vis-a-vis those tables and the efficiency penalties, but rather, um, I think there's other tables associated with, you know, y- y- if a unit takes X percent casualties, its morale can only ever be Y, um, or, you know, th- things along that nature. Uh, on the battle, we have continued to utilize or really honestly lean into the artillery um, to grant us uh, favorable casualty rates, and we've begun to transition to the offensive. Um, <clears throat> knowing what I know now about the battle and having watched it play out, uh, or, or rather played it out, I have a suspicion that I would have been better off, um, holding in the North in a defensive posture for a little while longer. And the reason I say that is that my units all take relatively uniformly around 400 casualties in this battle. Now, uh, and, and then there's obviously some standard deviation of that, but for the most part, roughly 400 casualties, uh, and that's fine for the purposes of, re- of replacing the unit or rebuilding it and that kind of thing. But it's, it's still kind of larger than I'd like, especially given that up until now, the union has continued to oblige me by way of attacking and I've suffered comparatively light casualties. So taking the attack to them may be a mistake. Um, however, in the moment, I'm thinking, oh, I need to relieve the pressure on the south, and the way that I do that is I attack in the north. Um, 
and I force the units back. And, and, and ultimately, it does work out. I'm not going to try and tell you that like this battle does not go well. Once again, the Grand uh, the South achieves 100% um, Union destruction. Uh, very little in the way of um, captures, however. Uh, but um, the behavior that I'm watching, it's 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 it seems evidenced that they'll continue to attack. So what I could have done is I could have maintained my position on the defensive, especially now that I've taken out their artillery in the north and waited for them to keep coming to me because they clearly would have kept coming to me. Um, and this may be a lesson to be learned from the battle um, is that Sometimes, even though you have contact with the enemy, it may not always be preferable to press that contact, even though you may have a local advantage. So I only attack when I generate a hole. When I when they retreat or route or whatever, I punch a hole. But sometimes attacking when, when those conditions are met doesn't necessarily mean you've moved into new, more different, strategically beneficial terrain. It just means you're attacking into different terrain and the people who would most immediately defend against your attack are not present, which is to say someone else might be. And I learned that the hard way a couple of times, especially trying to force them out of uh, the bottom of this U shape. Uh, they, they, I think very intelligently form a defensive line at the edge of the U. And while I'm able to fight them from my own version of cover, it, it still ultimately results into or devolves into units trading fire in the woods. And there's so many ways on this map, especially given the enemy's proclivity to attack the flag that I could have simply waited for them to come across the river. I've got two and a half hours still on this map, and I'm over here pressing the attack as if I, A, have some sort of flag to capture, and B, only have an hour to do it. Neither of those is true. Um, and I, I routinely chastise myself for being too aggressive. And uh, at the same time as I feel like, oh, aggression is my play style, and I like being aggressive, and that's certainly true, um, part of being aggressive is acknowledging and understanding that there are many times when it is encouraged or advisable not to be so where aggression will get you into trouble where patience might not or prudence would not um and in this instance all the aggression is getting me is uh a direct line of fire on their artillery warner or warnick or something like that in the woods there um or neither of those words at all Looks like Windrich, maybe. So not Warner or War Warwick at all. Windrich. Um, and it's giving me direct fire on their artillery. And like look, like I said, it does get me 100% destruction. But I think playing cagely and defensively would have done the same. Um, especially difficult or, or, or rough is the situation for first rifles who finds themselves at the moment um, outflanked and outmaneuvered or, or rather over uh, overexposed. Um, I had intended by now to have advanced fifth into a supporting position and have sixth on, um, the union side of the river. And as you can see, neither of those is true. Although there's no good reason why I couldn't have advanced fifth at this point in time. Um, <clears throat> I am continually trying to kick them out of the woods. And every time I discover, or every time I send a unit routing, um, I discover that there are two more, waiting in the woods so every time i send back that 825 man unit that's now 812 um there's donnelly waiting after the fact and and that continues for a while uh until ultimately i'm able to blast the confederates out of the woods um and when i do that you know th things pretty quickly improve um for uh, the confederate army but in the moment it's it's uh, whack-a-mole, basically. They route, and I advance, and then I discover that there are two units hanging out in the same space as there was one, and I need to fight them off, and then by the time they're routing or whatever, guess who's recovered and back in the fight? You know, and it's just this sort of cycle. Um, 
but you know that's a say la guerre i suppose um so i'm continuing the attack trying to see if i can't get artillery rounds on fremont yeah their general fremont um or making sure that i have enough troopers in here to continuously keep a a, a high rate of fire and force the union back out of the woods um which is only you know working so much I also, especially with the first artillery who has the horse artillery perk and is therefore quite a bit faster, I uh, keep pushing them up to try and uh, just, you know, use close range artillery to kick the Union out of the woods uh, even more. Um, I ended up uh, pulling forth across the river here, uh, crossing at the Ford side of it um, versus the bridge. That's, you know, that's basically what we keep on doing. We keep on grinding it out and pushing them out. So this ultimately goes very well for me, with the exception of the fact that I take more casualties than I would like to have, um, especially in some of my more veteran units, which is to say first infantry. Uh, but I don't I don't know. I don't I think that a fear of casualties, you know, should be reasonable. You should have a reasonable desire to maintain the quality of your command but at the same time you shouldn't be so afraid of casualty figures that you maybe give up advantageous terrain to ensure that you don't suffer heavily um, sometimes you have to risk your command to get good position or risk your men in order to um, fight off a good opponent or take good territory or you know do both theoretically uh, and I'm not, not I'm not saying like also don't care about casualties. Definitely, definitely care about casualties, but don't let them be the end all be all as I do realize could be, I think, you know, one of the traits or trends associated with uh, being concerned about casualties is we can't take any casualties. Well, you can and you will in this game especially, but um, you shouldn't let them dictate what you do and don't do. Um. So we're, uh, I think, slowly finally able to push the con Union out of the woods here. And I'm getting pretty excited because I can kind of see blood in the water um, and envision and envision the strategy that lets me kind of end this battle. Fifth Sharpshooter has continued to apply pressure at uh, the entirety of the Union line. Um, the other infantry units are all getting into position and, you know, fighting their way to the edge of the woods so that the Union has to fight from the open and everything else. What I forget in my advance is that there is a unit camped out in these trees and um, I pull back to rest uh, and to th see if maybe I can't trick them into coming to me. Um, but I realize that that's kind of a long shot. So uh, I push up eighth rifles and I leave <clears throat> the three units that are down there, down there, uh, Because I'm I'm successfully you know mauling the um, mauling the Union and units are slowly beginning to shatter uh, and so you know not that's all she wrote but it's you know it's getting to that point um, so yeah. Oh, this is a uh, particularly frustrating exchange of fire. So I've got three infantry brigades um, and a sniper unit, all and an artillery unit, all shooting at this unit of cannons. And uh, we, you know, route them, but then they just get back into the fight a second later. And it's because Fremont's still alive. Um, <clears throat> they're able to get multiple rounds of canister into uh, into my command, and it's. Let's just say it's not a good time. It's not a good time. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, I think um, we've got musketry being delivered directly to their artillery. That can't be good for it either. The other thing that you're seeing on the screen is um, the beginning of my final flank attack. So 8th, 3rd, and 2nd 
or rather 7th um, Infantry are flanking behind or marching uh, behind the Confederate position. And they're going to ultimately extend my line to the Confederate left, uh, which is to say continuing the line of the sharpshooters. They're going to continue that line and they're going to push the Union into the river. Uh, that is the dream. Um, and after a little bit of marching, that ultimately ends up being how it shakes out is ultimately the guys who are being shot at directly in front of them right now are, uh, which is to say 5th Infantry, 1st Rifles, and 6th. Um, they form the new wall. And uh, who did I just say? 3, 4, and 7, I think, are uh, the units that are going to function as the hammer in um, in the attack. So once they get into position, that is, of course, I'm going to send them to, you know, close the net, uh, basically. And like I said, we get the whole thing except for, I think, except for that supply wagon that was on the screen a second ago that has continued off onto the right. Uh, I don't get the supply wagon. I'm not mega terribly worried about it either, to be honest. Um, but it is, you know, it is a non-zero amount of money, so I probably should give the supply wagon more attention than I do. You know, it is what it is. Um yeah. So, uh, aside from the blow by blow, uh, once again, I think that I've never seen this battle play out in quite this way. Um, I've played the battle where um, I advance quickly and occupy those positions that I am currently occupying, uh, which is to say the, the long line of trees that form the U. I was on the outward edge of it, preventing... Um, the Confederates from attacking and everything else or union from attacking and everything else. Uh, and I, I just didn't have time to get in that position in this particular playthrough. Uh, again, because of the slowness of major general units and everything else. So instead I played it a bit more passively. So I've rarely seen this battle play out where I'm pocket holing, um, the entire union command in this one blotch of open field. Frequently they trickle off the map edge and that's, you know, all she wrote. And I'm sure that possibly it could be to a uh, um, like a different I don't know a different playthrough like you could you, you could end up here pocket hold in the woods or the the middle here but I've never seen it play out that way uh, as brigadier general but again I think that um, that might be tied to the brigadier general difficulty and the state of the Confederate army already by this point of the campaign. Um, far from being some kind of elite fighting force, the Confederate army by now is, you know, at least in a decent position. They've got some rifles and some veterans and so forth and so on. So, uh, you know, in, in the Brigadier campaign, you're, you're already in a pretty good place. Um, <clears throat> continuing to use the sharpshooters to apply continued pressure uh, to the Union, trying to make sure that they don't get the idea to squirt through um, on the southern edge of the map, and uh, seeing if I can't morale shock uh, artillery. That's my big, big, big want, is that. And then now I sort of, uh, I can sort of close the noose. You know, and we're closing up on the closing moments of the battle. And again, I, I had half an hour left to, to take action. And I, I do not know if this is one of the battles where once the timer runs out, that's all she wrote, or if you keep on fighting or, you know, whatever. And I, I don't know if that's how it would be in Pandemon either. So, you know, again, take a look at all the units and on average, you're looking at about 400 casualties. Now there's some, you know, that get off light third rifles, for example, they took, I don't know, um, 34, casualties whereas first rifles is down almost 500 so again the average is not indicative of all the units and so i'm frustrated that the, the veterans took the hits that they did whereas some of the other units didn't but again it, it is what it is and a lot of this is down to positioning um now that they're kind of pocketed off into this little corner here by the bridge i'm um 
deploying my troops in a way to counter them if they try and cross the bridge, um, counter them if they try and push uh, up on the screen. I don't actually know if that represents north as well. I would assume it does, but I'm not sure. So up, in, in basically in any direction. I'm trying to make sure they can't go anywhere, essentially. And um, yeah, so we box them off and that's all we do. Um, the, the rest of the battle is just clean up. So I will say, let's do kind of a wrap up um, in the last bit of a little bit of the video, cause we're closing on the end here. This was really fun. This continues to be really fun. The rebalance mod continues to be a lot of fun. There was definitely some initial growing pains. I had to get used to the pace. I had to get used to the speed with which combat would occur and units would degrade over time. Um, I have to get used to figuring out the numbers between what guns are good and what guns are meh and so forth and so on. That's all stuff I've got to work out still. There's still growing pains in a lot of those fields. However, I'm continuing to have fun, even if I'm playing in much the same way I would play um, the Union, or the, sorry, the, in the, much the way that I would play the vanilla game, which is to say a focus on fires and then um, an effective mix of short and long range artillery. However, um, that said, uh, it does also require me to think differently. One, my units being so slow means that I seriously have to consider um, how to utilize them. Two, the performance penalties associated with um, uh, extreme uh, exhaustion has caused me to slow the hell down. <laughs> uh, because I, I used to be very much like, go, 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 get in position and rest when you get there. And you can't do that, man. You can't, you can't do that. Um, So it looks like about 15,500 to 2,800 Union, or sorry, casualties uh, in favor of the Confederacy, obviously. So a little over five to one. And I'm not, I'm not mega terribly worried about kill ratios, but it's just kind of nice to have a look, see. Uh, we capture, this is huge, I think, 1,600 Springfield 1861. So these are top tier rifles relative to my perception. And um, that's enough for a whole brigade. Uh, or depending on what's in the store, that's enough for two brigades if I split it up um, and then kind of buy the remainder. Uh, I'm still not 100% sure what to use in the um, the career point here. Ultimately, I opt into medicine, thinking that all of the stats that I care about right now are around five, and it would be a good thing to get them kind of all leveled in unison versus trying to just focus on getting one done. Um, I'm not 100% sure 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 that that's the way that i should play that but you know whatever uh i spent a little bit of time as well kind of thinking about what do i need to do oh i have i have some 61s in stock as well cool i spent a little bit of time thinking about what do i need to do to grow for um the the next battle uh port republic i think is the same 12 or 11 type units um and then I think, <clears throat> um, so I can get 2,500 end fields as well. That'll be great. So between that and the 61s, we'll have four brigades armed with very modern rifles, uh, which is great. So they get 17,000 soldiers. We don't see, however, I don't have a way to know how, way to know how, if these soldiers are crack, elite, rookies, I'm not sure. So, um, you know, we'll figure that out. So, like I said, Port Republic we have, it looks like, 11 units that come along. And um, I'll need to prep basically 11 units to come, which will just be one less cannon, pretty much. Uh, and then we have... Uh, we have Gaines Mill itself. And in this battle, you can bring uh, a total of 66 brigades split across up to four core. So I'm thinking we're going to bring two. I don't, I don't know if I can grow an army large enough to field three core, or if I did, it would be a lot of like smaller 1,000-man brigades with percussion muskets and rebores. Um, 
So we'll just have to take a look at kind of how that shakes out. So like I said, I ultimately put the last pip of experience into medicine. Um, I'm taking casualties and I'd like to start getting some trickle back. So um, I do that because I don't think that we're going to run into an issue. We have enough weapons to equip what we've got. It's now a question of, yeah, I, I check, you know, what does a gun cost me? And it looks like a, gu a gun costs about what um, its equivalent does in the vanilla game. So I'm like, oh, okay, this is enough. I can go ahead and accept that. We'll start getting trickle back because again, trickle back is like getting a free veteran and a free gun. Um, so it's a very great kind of uh, stat to have. Anywho, that's um, pretty much all she wrote for uh, Cross Keys. Again, I had a really great time with this battle. It's a very fun fight. And Port Republic is a uh, similar battle that sees us engaging units in the woods and then trying to fend off a Union counterattack from our left. But uh, until then, I will see you next time. And this is Fiasco, signing out.